Hello everyone, welcome to this video where we'll create a basic web application in Java. In this video, we're going to introduce some of the tools and servers that you can use to create and deploy web applications in Java. We're also going to introduce the basics about Java servlets and about Java server pages or JSPs. And we're of course going to create a simple web application in Java and see a couple of options to read input data from the request and print output data in the response back to the user. In this particular video, we will use Eclipse as the IDE. Eclipse is an open source IDE that has free plugins available to work with web applications in Java. Of course, feel free to use a different IDE, like IntelliJ or NetBeans, for example. In the case of IntelliJ, as far as I've seen, the community edition doesn't come with out-of-the-box support for deployments to web application servers. However, if you have the ultimate edition of IntelliJ, you will have access to these added features. If you want to use the same version of Eclipse that I'll be using, head to the Eclipse website and you can click on the download link and here you're going to get a download packages option. And for web projects, I recommend that you download the Enterprise Java Developers Edition as it already comes with the Web Tools platform and the Gradle plugin installed, which we're going to use in this video. In case that you already have an Eclipse version in your machine and you want to use the same one, make sure that you have those two plugins installed before proceeding with this tutorial. The second tool that we're going to need is Gradle. Gradle is a build automation tool that supports several languages and technologies, including different types of Java applications. Even though we don't actually need Gradle to build this application, if you're learning Java or any other programming language, my recommendation is to use the industry adopted build tools for the language that you're learning. It will get you up to speed faster. There are different build tools for Java. Two of the most popular in the industry right now are Maven and Gradle. In this video, we will be using Gradle to set up our basic web application project. To install Gradle in your machine, you can go to the Gradle website and click on the Install Gradle option. And it's going to give you instructions for your respective platform. At the time of recording this video, Gradle is currently in version 6.5, but you can follow a similar setup with Gradle 5 in case that you already have it installed. The third item that we're going to download is a Java web application server that supports Java servlets and JSPs. Those are the two main Java technologies that we will be using in this video. Inside this server is where we're going to deploy the web application. For the purpose of this video, we will be using Apache Tomcat. In the same line as the build tool, there are different options in the market that we can use for the web application server, including Jetty, Wildfly and Glassfish. To download Tomcat, uh, we're going to head to the official website and click on the download option for Tomcat version 9. At the time of recording this video, version 10 is still in alpha, so we won't be using that version yet. Once you're in the downloads page, um, what you need to download here is what is called a core binary distribution, which is over here in this list. And in my case, I'm using a Windows 64-bit machine, so I'll download, of course, the 64-bit Windows zip file. And once you have the zip file, all you need to do is uncompress it in your machine. But please do make a note of the location where you put the binary installation, like the uncompressed folder, as we're going to use it later. And finally, we will need Java installed in our machine. If you already have Java 8 or above installed in your machine, feel free to disregard this step. In case that you need to install Java, um, there are different versions provided by different vendors and communities. For example, you can head to the Adopt OpenJDK website and download a version of Java from there. For the purpose of this tutorial, any version uh, from Java 8 and above works. In my case, I already have Java 11 installed, so I'm going to be using that version. Excellent. Now that we have all the different tools installed or downloaded locally, we will proceed to create our first web application in Java. For the first part of this video, we're going to create a web Java project with a simple Java servlet that is going to print out a hello message back to the user every time that we get a request to a particular URL. Java servlets or servlets in Java allow developers to generate dynamic content in web applications using a request response programming model. An example of a request response protocol is the HTTP protocol that is widely used for the web. In our case, let's say that we open a web browser and we type in the address for our example web application. Behind the scenes, the browser will send an HTTP request that our server can process. Here, we can generate the dynamic content required based on that request 
and then we can send back an HTTP response to our browser. The first step that we're going to take is defining our Java web project in Gradle and creating the basic folder structure that we need for it. If this is the first time that you use Gradle, it is important to note that the main file that Gradle expects to find is called the build.gradle file and it defines the configuration of our project. So we're going to create an empty folder and in my case, I'm going to call it example web. And inside, I'm going to create an empty build.gradle file. Don't worry if you're unfamiliar with Gradle. We will provide an introduction to the different things that we'll be adding to our project. And our build file is going to be very short and is not going to include anything out of the ordinary. So let's open that file in a text editor. And the first thing that we're going to add is a plugin called war to our build. And we do that by adding up a block called plugins and inside giving the ID of the plugin that we want to add, in this case, the war plugin. This plugin is the one that provides support for Java web applications in Gradle. The plugins in Gradle can do multiple things behind the scenes. In the case of the WAR plugin, it will include tasks that will go from compiling our Java classes to tasks that we can run to generate a WAR file. WAR files are standard web application artifacts that include all of the code in our application. Configuration files, static files, like HTML pages, images, CSS files that we have defined in our web application project. Now, the second configuration that we're going to add is a repository section. Repositories tell Gradle where we want to get the project dependencies and libraries. Gradle provides support for most of the industry-wide repositories out of the box. So we can add the following, say jcenter, and it will add the configuration to connect to the jcenter repository to download the dependencies that we require. And finally, we're going to add the dependency section where we can add the libraries that we depend on. In our case, as we're going to use Java servlets, uh, we need to add the JavaX servlet API dependency. And we do that with the following command. Don't worry, you don't need to remember this by heart. I'm going to add links uh, to these files in the video description. Basically, here we're telling Gradle that we want to include uh, version 4.0.1 of a library that is called javax.servlet-api. An important thing to note here is that we're using this provided compile option. This tells Gradle that we need this library only for local development, but that it shouldn't include it in the generated WAR file. The main reason to do this, and it depends on your use case, of course, is that web application servers, for example, Tomcat, they already have this library inside of the server, so we don't need to provide it again. This is only required when you're developing locally. Excellent, that's basically the configuration of our Gradle uh, project. And the first thing that I want to do is I want to open a command line, a terminal window. And at the moment, I'm in the same folder where I have my build.gradle file, so you can check it here, build.gradle. And I just want to run the following command. Gradle tasks. This is just basically to verify that I didn't uh, add any typos or small errors in the in the build. Excellent. So you can see that the build was successful. So basically, Gradle was able to analyze and understand the build configuration that we provided. And when you run Gradle tasks, it's gonna give you all of the different options that you can execute uh, in your Gradle project. So for example, because we added a WAR plugin, uh, there is a WAR option, like a WAR task that you can run, as I said, to generate this special WAR archive that has all the compiled classes, the content of your web application, and the libraries that you add as dependencies. Excellent. Now we can close this file. The last step before we actually open our IDE, like we open Eclipse and start coding, is to create the basic folder structure required for our web application project. The folder structure that we're going to create is used by convention by different build tools, including Gradle. Of course, you can use a different folder structure if you want, but you will need to tell Gradle what folder structure you're going to be using. Because we're going to follow the convention that Gradle uses and that other build tools use, 
We don't need to tell Gradle anything else in the build.gradle file. So let's go ahead and we're going to create a source folder. And inside the source folder, we're going to create a main subfolder. The main subfolder represents the application's code. Basically, what is the code that we would want to deploy to our servers. Inside the main subfolder, we're going to create a Java folder. And this is where we're going to include all, all the Java packages and the Java classes and interfaces that we're going to create in, in our project. And we're also going to create a folder called WebUp. And this is where we're going to include uh, additional web resources, for example, static files like HTML pages, images, CSS files. And here is where we're also going to include the JSP pages that we are going to create at the end of the video. These web application resources are also going to be deployed alongside with our code when we are using web applications. There are a couple of extra folders that we can add here, but they're outside of the scope of this tutorial video, so we're not going to use them. So great, I mean, we have our Gradle project configuration and also the basic uh, folder structure that we're going to need. So let's go ahead and open Eclipse to import our project. If you haven't used Eclipse before, the first thing that it's going to ask you is to choose what it calls a workspace folder. Eclipse uses workspace folders to store your preferences and some of the development artifacts uh, that are generated whilst you work in your projects. So feel free to choose an empty folder as your workspace. I already have mine over here and click the launch button. Also, if this is the first time that you open Eclipse, it will greet you with this welcome screen that gives you different options. Feel free to check it out. Uh, however, in our case, we're not going to use it. Uh, so I'm going to close the welcome screen. Now, as we already have a project defined in Gradle, uh, we can ask Eclipse to import that project for us. So we can click on import projects and select uh, the Gradle option. Inside the project root directory, uh, you need to select the folder where you have the build.gradle file. In my case, it's this folder over here. And you can just click next. When you get to this import options page, uh, you don't need to change anything really. Uh, Eclipse is going to identify usually things uh, correctly for you for the, Im for imp for the import options. Now, when I click next, what Eclipse is doing, it's analyzing our Gradle build and it's going to tell us what is actually going to import. In our case, because this is a simple Gradle project, we are basically told that it's going to import just one project in our case. And that's exactly what we want. So I'm going to click finish. And once I click finish, of course, you can see that now our project appears here in the top left hand side. And now that the project is imported, let's check a couple of things before we actually start coding. First of all, let's right click on the project and go to the properties. And here, click on the project facets option. You can see here that Eclipse already identified that this is a web project. So it identifies that one of the facets of a project is that it's a dynamic web module, which is basically a, a project that has support for Java serverlet APIs and dynamic web content. So that's great. I mean, that's exactly what we wanted to happen. The second thing that I want you to check is if you open the Java resources uh, folder over here, you're going to see that Eclipse chose us the source main Java folder that we created. Here is where we're going to add our Java packages and the Java code for this, uh, for the sample tutorial and where you should add, of course, the Java code for your web project. Third is that the source main web app folder, you can see that it's not here in the Java resources because, of course, the web app is not really Java classes or Java code. So you're going to find it out here. So source main and the web app folder is over here. So that's great. I mean, now that we have our example project, we can start adding our first HTTP servlet. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to define a Java package. And in my case, I'm going to call it io.jcoder. Dot example web. Feel free to use a different package name, of course. 
And now inside that package, I'm gonna create a class called the greeting servlet. Greeting servlet. To use this class as an HTTP servlet uh, and configure it accordingly, we need to do two things. The first thing that we need to do is that we need to extend from a class called HTTP servlet. And this class comes from the library from the javax.servlet dependency that we added in the build.gradle file. The reason that we can actually use this class here is because we added that dependency in the build.gradle file. So if I check the libraries that Eclipse, of course, identified because they come included in the build.gradle and I click on project and external dependencies, you're going to see here that the dependency to the servlet API has been included, which is exactly what we wanted. Now, the second thing that we need to add is a web servlet annotation. And the application server, in this case, in, in the case of, for example, Tomcat, they're gonna identify these annotations and make our servlet available to our users. Inside this annotation, I'm gonna provide three different things. I'm gonna give a name to our servlet, in my case, greeting servlet. I'm gonna define something called URL patterns. And in my case, the URL pattern that I want is slash greeting. And we're also gonna tell it load on a startup equals one. Load on a startup equals one means that as soon as the web application server starts up, it should also load uh, the servlet for us automatically. This is the basic structure, let's say, for defining HTTP servlets in Java, right? And this is gonna define like different entry points for your web application. Inside our class, we can override different methods of the HTTP servlet class. You're gonna see a lot of do methods, like for example, do get, do post, do put, right? And for this particular case in our example, we're gonna override the do get method. As we said before, servlets follow a request response model. And this is exactly what we can see in this method. Requests basically represent the input data that is coming from the web browsers or from the requests from our clients. And the response is the data that we want to send back to our users. For this greeting servlet, all we want to do based on what we discussed before is print out a hello message. That's all we want to do. So to do that, the response object provides us a, a writer object. So I can say response.getWriter. And here we can just basically print out our hello message. With this in place, we can start giving this a try to make sure that the basics are working as expected. So the next thing that we're gonna do is deploy this servlet inside our Tomcat server. The first thing that we need to do is to add the server configuration like the Tomcat server inside of Eclipse. So in my case, I already have the servers view open, but if you don't have the servers view open over here, you can go to window, show view and click on servers. It's gonna show it uh, on your screen. So we're gonna create the link to create a new server. And here I'm gonna select Apache Tomcat Knight because basically that's the server that, that we downloaded. And I'm gonna click next. And here on the Tomcat installation directory, this is where you need to put the location of where you uncompress the Tomcat 9 binaries. This is the location I have in my case. And I'm gonna select uh, JDK 11, which is the Java version that I have installed. And then click next. In the last step, uh, Eclipse is going to ask you what projects you want to deploy into that Tomcat server. You can see that our example web project is an available option. So basically this is telling us that Eclipse correctly identified our project as a web project and that we can deploy it inside of a server. So we're gonna do exactly that. So we're gonna say, yeah, I want to deploy that project and click finish. Our Tomcat server now appears in the servers list. If you expand it, you're gonna see the list of projects that have been added to, to the server for deployment. In our case, only your example web project. Of course, you can deploy multiple web projects uh, inside the same server. In our case, we only have one. The other thing that you can do is you can double click on the server and it's gonna open and show you additional configuration options for that server. One of the configurations here that is important to note 
uh, is the HTTP number, uh, the, the, sorry, the HTTP port number uh, that the server is going to use to accept connections for HTTP requests. By default, it is configured to start the HTTP server on port 8080. That tends to be the standard uh, for development servers in Java. In the case that you have another application in your machine, uh, for whatever reason, that is already using the same port number, you are going to need to change this. So either you stop the other application that is using the port, or you change this number to something different. Once you change it, uh, you need to save the configuration and then it's going to run on a different port number. Later in the video, you're going to see that I use port 8080 and this is the reason I use that port number is because Tomcat is using that port number to listen to HTTP requests. Excellent. Now we have both a simple web project and a web application server with our project configured for deployment. So let's start our server and see if everything works correctly. So let's start the server. And in the console output, you can see that the server has been started. So server startup, so it looks okay. And that it's using, in my case, port 8080 uh, for the HTTP requests. So yeah, let's give this a try. I mean, the server is up and running. We have a servlet and let's see if actually it responds to requests. So I'm going to open a browser, I'm going to minimize this a little bit. In the address bar, what we're going to type is localhost colon 8080. Uh, localhost because that's where we're running the server because we're running it on our local machine. 8080, as I said before, because that's the port where Tomcat is listening for HTTP requests. And by default, in Eclipse, the project name that we have, in our case, example web, is going to be used as the context of our application. So we need to add slash example web. And finally, we need to add the URL pattern that we defined for our servlet. In our case, slash greeting. And let's press enter. So great, as expected, we get hello as the response back from the server. If you want to see what is happening a little bit behind the scenes, and you're not familiar with the developer tools that different browsers now include. In the case of Google Chrome, you can go to the developer tools option and here click on the network tab. Now let's try to refresh this page. So you can see that the request is sent by the browser, right? And you can see here that it's actually to the URL that we just uh, provided, which is localhost 8080 example web slash greeting. And here you can see different things that happen behind the scenes if you want to see a little bit more in detail what is happening under the hood. So for example, you can see uh, a lot of the details about the request that is sent and you can also see the actual response that we got back from the server. In our case, well, it's only the hello string. If we try to access a different URL pattern, so let's say that instead of greeting, we say greeting two, uh, we're going to get a 404 error. And this is basically Tomcat telling us that it cannot find this resource, right? This resource doesn't exist. It is important to know that the same servlet can respond to multiple URL patterns. So that's why here it accepts an array of strings, right? We can provide multiple URL patterns. So for example, I'm going to minimize the browser. Uh, let's say that besides the greeting pattern, I'm going to stop my server for a second. We also want to add slash test slash star, right? And this is basically to show you that URL patterns accept wildcards. In this case, this servlet is going to be called every time that this pattern is matched. So let's run the server again. And let's try that. So let's, we said that it's going to match greeting, right? So if I go to greeting, it works. If I go to test, it also works because it matches that pattern. And if you go to anything that just matches that wildcard, right? ABC, ABC1, it doesn't really matter what we provide afterwards. It's going to work, right? However, if we provide a different pattern that is outside of what we just added, we're going to get an error saying that that resource is not available. Cool. So now this greeting servlet isn't really doing anything dynamic. Right? It's always printing out the, uh, a hello message to a response. And this is basically just to show the basics of how to do an HTTP servlet. For the second example, we actually want to create a basic 
HTML form that will receive the name and email address of a user and send those details back for processing in the server. In the response, I want to print out the name, the email, and the IP address that we received in the request. Again, this is a simple example, just with the purpose of showing how we can read details from the request and how to print out a response based on that input data. So the first thing that we're going to do is, of course, create our form. And to do that, we're going to create a new index.html page. So I'm going to create an HTML page. In my case, I'm going to call it index.html. We're going to set a title for it. So let's say we're going to call it basic form. And inside the body of the page, uh, we're going to add our form. So we're going to say form. And we're going to provide a, an attribute called action. And inside that attribute, uh, we're going to give it the value called process. This over here, the process part, is the URL that the browser is going to use to send the data. At the moment, we don't have any servlet that responds to that URL pattern. I mean, we don't have anything that responds to a slash process, but we're going to add that shortly. Inside the form, we're going to add the fields to get the name and the email address. So we're going to add name, and here we're going to put a text box. And we're going to call this field name, of course. Another break line. We're going to do the same for the email. Apologies, I'm going to just copy paste this and I'm going to call it email. And lastly, for the purpose of this simple example, we're going to add a submit button. And that's it. So again, this is a very simple page. It has no formatting whatsoever, so it's going to look a bit old fashioned, but it helps us to demonstrate the concepts that we want to introduce in this tutorial. Let's run our server again and head to our index.html page, right? So example web slash index.html. Excellent. Now we get the form as expected and let's add some dummy data to it. So let's say that the name is name and the email is a at a.com, right? And when we click submit, we get a 404 error as we haven't defined a servlet that can handle that process URL pattern. However, you're gonna see that the browser added two parameters to that URL. And the, it added those parameters after this question mark. These over here are called query parameters. And as you can see, these correspond to the names of the fields that we provided in the form. So we have a name and we have an email. Let's add now the servlet that is going to process that request. So we're gonna go back to the IDE. And we're gonna create a new class and we're going to call it, say, form processing servlet, right? And we want this class to also be uh, used as an HTTP servlet for web applications. So that means that we need to extend the HTTP servlet class and we need to add the web servlet annotation. So we're also going to give it a name. So I'm just going to, in our case, I'm going to call it form processing servlet. And the URL pattern that I want to process, of course, in our case, is the pattern process. And of course, this is the URL that we added in our HTML form. So I want this to correspond to this uh, pattern as well. And finally, I also want this servlet to load and start. I need to import the HTTP servlet class and that should be it. Okay, now, so we have a new servlet and we're also gonna override in our case the do get method. The next thing that we're gonna do is that we're gonna get the name and the email from our request. To do this, we can use the get parameter method that comes from the request object. So let's define a variable called name and call that get parameter method. And the, the name of the parameter that we want to retrieve is name, right? So this name over here corresponds to the name field of our first input text box. And let's do the same with the email, right? So I also want to get the email that we received from that request. For this example, uh, all we want to do is print out the name, the email, and the IP address of the request back in the response. 
However, you can see how we can get details or input data from the request, like we're doing here. And then we can do here some like internal processing with that data. If we wanted to do something with, with those details and then print out the result back to the user. So, okay, let's print the three details that we want. So let's get the print writer out of the response. So we're gonna get a print writer and we're gonna print out the name. So we're gonna say, okay, the name is the name and we're also gonna print out the email. We're gonna do exactly the same. And the last thing that we want to do is print out the IP address that we got in the request. So to do that, the request object has a method called get remote address, and that's exactly the method that we're gonna use. Cool, so now let's restart our server. And let's go back to our form. Right, so we have again our form in the index.html page. And now when we click the submit button, we can see that the form processing server was invoked and we get the three fields that we wanted. So we get the name, the email, and the IP address that the request uh, has in memory. So what we just saw is what is called an HTTP GET request. When you use GET requests uh, with parameters, like in your case, we're sending uh, two form parameters, the name and the email, uh, those details are appended to the URL by the browser, right? And these again are called query parameters. Depending on the use case that you have, this might not be ideal, and you might not want those details to be visible in the URL. For example, if you're sending, for example, credit card details or password information, this is not a good solution. Another method that we can use in HTTP requests is the post method. To change this, uh, let's open again our index.html page, and inside the form tag, we're gonna add a method attribute, and instead of get, which is the default, we're gonna tell it that we want to use post. So let's uh, run the server again. And let's refresh the form. Say, okay, it's gonna be name of user. Let's do a different email this time. And let's click the submit button now. Okay, in, in this case, you should have received a 405 error telling you that the post method is not supported by that servlet. And yes, this is right. We haven't configured our, serv our servlet to support post requests. Now, the reason for that is that in the form processing servlet, we are overriding the do get method. Remember that HTTP servlets uh, have different methods that you can override and they correspond to the HTTP methods that are available in the, in the protocol. So, so instead of overriding the do get method, let's override the do post method instead. I'll terminate the server. We're gonna use the same code as we want exactly the same logic for the purpose of our example. The HTTP servlet class documentation is, I mean, if you check it here, the HTTP servlet, it shows us that it provides different do methods for the different HTTP methods uh, that are available. And we are expected to override at least one of those do star methods. So let's give this a try now with this change. And let's open the browser again. And when I submit the data again, now you can see that in this case, because I'm sending the details using a post method, they're not appended to the URL, right? So they're not query parameters anymore. However, the form data still is still being sent in the request. And you can see that we can read the parameters in exactly the same way as we did for our get request when we had the get method. So let's take a look at what's happening behind the scenes. So I'm gonna click, I open the network tab again, and I'm gonna click the preserve log. And now I'm gonna click submit button again. So I'm gonna resubmit the form. And you can see that of course, it's showing us that it called the browser called the process uh, URL. And if you check here inside of the headers tab, if I go well to the bottom, you're gonna see that it tells us that it sent some form data uh, and it sent two different parameters. It sent the name and the email with the values that we provided in the form. So this is what the browser is sending to our server, right? And because we received this form data, 
we can read those values as parameters from the request, same as we did with uh, query parameters as well. Great, so, so far we have created, configured, and deployed a simple web application in Java that can read the data that is passed from the request and it can print out a basic response back to the user. However, something that is important to note is that we are not printing or returning a valid HTML page to our user. We are just returning plain text over here. So depending on the use case that you have, this might be okay, but you might want to return a valid HTML page in your response. Again, it depends on the use case. One way that we have to do this, of course, is that we could use our print writer over here and start printing HTML tags. Right, so we could print our HTML tag and then print the head, the title, and you see where this is going, right? Even though we can do this, this isn't a great approach. One reason is that, of course, Java isn't built to render HTML inside Java methods. And second is that in terms of separating responsibilities or concerns, if we do this, we're making our servlet responsible of processing the request, so we don't know how big this is going to be or how many things it's going to have to do, and also responsible of knowing how to render uh, the result back to the user. Now, there are plenty of different solutions that we can use, and this is an area where web frameworks in Java are particularly good. For example, you can use a templating engine like FreeMarker, Velocity, or Timeleaf for this purpose. All of them are great solutions for this. And they're not the only ones in the market. I'm just mentioning a couple of them. However, as we mentioned in the introduction of this video, we want to introduce Java server pages or JSPs, which we can also use for this purpose. So let's create our first JSP page inside the web application folder. So we're gonna create here a new JSP file and we're gonna call it process.jsp. So at first glance, uh, it looks like a normal HTML page. So let's uh, the title, let's call this page that is gonna be the process data page. And the main difference, however, is that we can add Java code inside this page to render dynamic content. JSPs provide different ways of doing these things. And in this video, I'm only gonna show you at a couple of examples. So one of the ways of doing this is by using what are called scriptlets, which are represented by the following tag, right? Which is basically a tag with a percentage symbol in it. And inside this tag, we can add Java code. As this is a JSP page, we get access to several Im implicit objects they're called, like our request and response objects. We also get access to the print writer. So remember the one that we were using in the servlets, and it's gonna be a, an object that is called out. So for example, we could do the following. We could define a variable x, and we could use that implicit object out to print out that x variable. And this is basically gonna put the hello message in the response between the body tags. And basically you can put any Java code that you want in here, right? This process of printing out a variable or something, or printing out an object and putting it in the response, uh, this is a very common use case. So JSPs provide us what are called uh, JSP expressions, which summarize exactly that. So I can do uh, the following tag, which the main difference is that I put an equal sign in it, and it's gonna print the object that results from the expression, from the Java expression that I add in the middle. So as I said before, we have access to the request object, and we can do the same that we did in the servlets. So for example, we can do request, let's get parameter and get the name, right? And this is gonna print the name parameter that we get from the request, same as we did in the, in the servlets, right? So we're gonna do this for the name, we're gonna print that, and we're gonna do the same for the email, right? For the IP address, uh, of course, I could call exactly the same. In exactly the same way, I could call instead of calling the get parameter, I could call the get request, the get remote address method. Uh, 
However, I want to show you something additional uh, as part of this video. So I'm not going to use this approach at the moment, okay? I want to assume that the IP address that I want to actually display on this page is the result of some processing that is going to happen in the servlet, right? So let's assume that there is some processing happening behind the scenes and this IP address is going to be the result of that processing. So the main mechanism for this type of behaviors is what are called attributes. And attributes cannot be added uh, at different levels, and that's outside of the scope of this video. But we can use request attributes. So instead of calling get parameter, I want to call get attribute, right? And I want I, I'm telling the JSP page that I wanted to render an attribute from the request that is called IP. Of course, so far we haven't added any attributes, so this is not going to print anything at the moment. What we want to do is in the servlet where we're processing the data, we actually want to set that attribute to make it available to our JSP page. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is remove all this printing code because I don't want it in my servlet. And uh, let's define, actually, let's call it IP and email. What I want this variable to be is going to be, of course, the concatenation of the remote address and the email of the user. As I said, if I want to make data available to the JSP page, I'm going to use what are called attributes in the request. So I can, in my request object, call a set attribute method. And the name that we gave it in our JSP, I mean, the name that is expecting is IP. So I'm going to use IP as well here. And I'm going to put my IP and email object as the value. And the last thing that we need to tell our servlet is to actually go to the JSP page for rendering, right? And to do this, we use what is called a request dispatcher. And basically, that's a method inside a request object. And we can get a request dispatcher. And the parameter that we pass here is the path where we want to dispatch our request to. In our case, our process.jsp page. And once we get that request dispatcher object, we want to call the forward method on it and pass it the request and the response that we're processing. And that's it. We should be able now to run our server again. And let's terminate it and let's restart it. Let's open the browser again. And if we fill the form again, so let's put here name two and let's add a different email address and let's click the submit button again. So something you're going to notice here is that of course the IP address that we're printing out is the concatenation of the IP and the email address. So I know that this is actually working and it's using the servlet. And you can see that the title of the page is process data. So this is a hint of course that the rendering part was done by your JSP page. However, notice that the URL didn't change. So it, the, the fact that the rendering was done by the JSP page, like by this process.jsp page, was transparent to the browser. The, the browser never saw that this process.jsp page was involved. And if we check the source of the page, we can see that we got an HTML page, which is exactly that we wanted. And not only that, the rendering of the content is separate from the code that is processing the request. So a couple of things that are important to clarify after this tutorial. First of all, uh, there are plenty more topics to cover when using Java servlets and JSP pages. The purpose of this tutorial is to provide you with a basic setup and show the basics of what can be done. In the same way, it is important to understand the different methods in the HTTP protocol and the guidance about when to use the different methods. Second is that there are several web frameworks and libraries that can be used to simplify or complement this basic structure. However, most of these frameworks use some of the concepts of technologies that we saw in this video as their foundation. And some of the concepts that you saw in this video have similar counterparts in multiple frameworks. And understanding this basic structure can help you understand how other web frameworks work behind the scenes. And congratulations, you created your first web application in Java. Now, before we finish the video, uh, one last thing to see is how to generate a web application archive or WAR file. 
And these WAR files are the ones that we can deploy inside a web application server. Let's say that you want to actually move this to a production environment, right? So let's go to our terminal. And here I'm going to, let's clear the screen. I'm going to run Gradle WAR, which is the task that I told you that was available. Uh, you can see that the build was successful. And if I go to the folder where we have the project, you're going to see that there is a build folder in here. And if I go to the lips folder inside, you can see that there is a WAR file in there. This is your web application, right? So you can take this file, for example, and put it in a web application server uh, somewhere else, like in a production environment, for example, right? If I open this with, to check the, the internals of what is happening inside the WAR file, you're going to see that, of course, we have the resources that we created, in our case, the HTML page with that had the form and the JSP page that we just created. And if I go inside the web folder, uh, you're going to see that it includes the classes, like the compiled classes of our two servlets. You're also going to notice that the javax.servlet API, that dependency that we added, is not included as part of this wire file. And that's because we use the provided compile word in the build.gradle file. Another option, of course, I mean, if you have other libraries that you want to use, is to use the word compile instead of provided compile. And it's going to include those libraries inside the WAR file. And there are different options, especially now in Gradle 5 and 6, besides provided compile and compile, that you can use to modify the behavior of how the libraries are used in your project. And that's it, everyone. We hope you found this video useful. If you're looking for other videos on specific Java topics, feel free to leave us a comment. Remember to subscribe to our channel. And if you found this useful, don't forget to click the like button. Thanks for watching, everyone.